Good morning, everyone, and welcome, online students. Thank you, Nina, John, Chaya, Prince, Shimf Kumar, for joining us. Welcome to our in-person students, and um, also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask um, uh, Chaya Paul, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me, Pastor? Hello, Pastor, can you hear me? Uh, we can't, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. We can hear from uh, our students' mobile phones. So you can go ahead and pray. Yeah. Okay, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning peace and the time with you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, giving us so wonderful teachings, oh, Lord Jesus, Father. We are learning, Father. Give us that sound mind, oh, Lord Jesus, Father. Sound understanding and concentration, oh, Lord Jesus, Father. So... We will be learning, we will be able to practice it, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless Pastor Selena, all these in-person students and online students. And we commit all of us into your mighty hand, Father. Please lead us and guide us and let your Holy Spirit dwell among us and make us understand each and everything, whatever we learn today. In Jesus' mighty name, I surrender all our class, our teacher, our students into your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chaya Paul. Uh, yesterday, we completed uh, studying chapter one. Today, we'll begin uh, chapter two of Romans. So please turn in your Bibles to uh, chapter two, Romans chapter two. And... Um, can someone please read verses 1 to 11, please? Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Yeah, Sri Radha can read, yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 from 11. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, wh whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you, des or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and your imp imp impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and reveling, reveling, revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continue, continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immorality. Immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works that is what is good to the Jew and uh, first, and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Amen. So in chapter 2, Paul is basically dealing with the issue of law and conscience, okay, both with the Jews and the Gentiles, okay. So when Paul is writing this here, he's basically debating within himself you know, with the mind of the reader. So he's actually thinking when people read this, you know, what will they, what will the debate or what will the argument that will go on in their mind? What will they be thinking? So he's basically debating within himself, within with the mind of the 
reader. Okay, so the whole issue in this chapter is about the law and the conscience with respect to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, the Jews have what? What was given to them? What did God give them? The law. Yes, they were given the law, they were given the commandments, they were given the decrees. Okay. And so Paul says that because they were given the law, they will be judged by what? The law. Yes. And are the Gentiles given the law? No. Then how will the Gentiles be judged? Yes, the Gentiles will be judged according to their conscience. Okay. So for the Jews, Paul says that there is a law that is built, uh, that is there, okay? And for the Gentiles, he says conscience. And he says there is an inbuilt law within each and every person, okay? And what is this inbuilt law he's saying that is there within every person? Their conscience or their reason, two things, their reason and their conscience, which means, you know, every person, the way that God has designed us, the way that God has made us, he's already given us two things. And what are those two things? He's already given us two things, whether we are Jews or Gentiles. What are the two things? Reason and conscience. Okay. And what does this reason and conscience do? Okay. Think with chapter one, what he ended with chapter one. What did he end chapter one with? He says no one is can give any excuse that there is no God. Why? Creation itself reveals the invisible attributes of God. It reveals the eternal Godhead. Okay, it reveals the invisible attributes of God. God. So how do you how do you seek uh, uh, God in creation with your with your mind reason you reason right hey you know there are seasons everything is going in a set pattern you know uh, even uh, the sun coming up the sun setting the moon and the stars coming up everything seasons everything there is a pattern so we reason in our mind how can this just be you know coming with a big bang right or big click of your finger or you know things coming to just coming automatically this is there has to be a hand of a divine creator and that is god so he's saying he's coming from that place and he's telling here in chapter two that god has given in everybody two things he's placed two things in everybody that is reason and conscience okay the way that each one of us are des uh, designed, wired, created, made. God has already given each one of us two things, and that is reason and conscience. So what does reason and conscience do? What does reason do? Seek, inquire what? Seek and inquire that there is a God. Reason that there is God. Okay. So reason tells us, hey, there is a God. Things can't just happen automatically. You know, uh, uh, neurons, protons, uh, you know, electrons, all cannot just come together and create something. Okay. And everything is in such order and perfection and season. All can't just happen automatically by itself. There has to be someone's divine wisdom and hand behind all of these things. Okay. So reason tells us that there is God. And what does your conscience tell you? Ah, moral, right or wrong. Conscience tells you when you have done something right or when it have done something wrong. Okay. So there is reason and there is conscience. So those, Paul is saying, those who do not have the law, you Gentiles, you don't have the law. So you can't say, hey, we cannot be judged. God cannot judge us because we don't have the law. But he's saying, hey, you can be judged because you have the conscience and the reason. Okay, so Paul says everyone will be judged. And what does he say? Everyone will be judged according to what? Look at what it says. Not your reason and conscience, finally. Everyone will be judged according to the according to the gospel. Okay, of Jesus Christ. 
So he says, everyone will be judged according to the gospel, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Okay, so that is what is basically he's trying to talk about or elaborate in chapter two. Okay, so we look at uh, verse one. He says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge an other, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. So Paul, in chapter 1, he says man is sinful, right? Wicked. You know, he, and how has he come to such sinful depravity is because depravity is because he has suppressed the truth. Even after knowing the truth, he has suppressed the truth. And because he has suppressed the truth, he, his mind has led him to indulge in every kind of his own wild evil passions. And the thoughts of his mind are all corrupted. Okay. So he's saying, man, Therefore, you are inexcusable. You can't give any excuse that, hey, we didn't know this is sin. We didn't have law. There was no one to teach us. There was no one to um, tell us. And then he's telling the Jews that, hey, you can't judge someone else because you have the law. You can't judge and say what you're doing is right and wrong. You too are inexcusable. Okay. So he's telling the Jews that you who teach the law, you know, you don't keep the law your self you who teach you know you should not commit adultery you're already commit you're also indulging in acts of adultery you who say you should not lie and murder you yourself are doing uh, lying and you yourself are murdering people when when jesus says the kingdom of god is it's not just murdering is sin but also when you hate someone in your heart is equal to murder and you commit adultery not only in the act of committing adultery but jesus says the kingdom is of God is how? When you look lustfully against a woman or a man, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So he's saying, hey, you Jews, you don't take the law and you don't keep judging others. Because whatever the point, you are judging others, you yourself are not keeping the law. So it's pointless. You know, you don't go around judging others. And... Um, and we can point to the Gentiles saying that, hey, they're doing all of these things, but they too are inexcusable. Why are they inexcusable? Because they have the, law, the, the reason and their conscience. Because when we judge others, why are we inexcusable? We are inexcusable because when we judge others, we too will be, we too are falling in the same sins or we are doing sins that you know, are equal to the other sins that people are doing. And, you know, when we judge others, we too will be judged with the same standards. Okay. So that is what he's telling in verses one and two. Okay. Because he says, but we know that judgment of God is according to the truth and against those who practice such things. And he says, whoever you are, you are who judge for in whatever you judge another, you condemn your Selves, for you who judge practice the same things okay so you are, don't judge others because you yourself are falling in the same sins or you're doing other sins that are mounting up to what others are also doing and also you know when you judge others you too will be judged by the same standards okay verse 3 says and do you think this O man you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God, okay? So saying you're doing the same things, okay? You think you will escape the judgment of God? No, you will not escape the judgment of God, okay? So it says everyone, whether you are a Jew or a Greek, you know, or a Gentile, you are going to be judged by the things that you are doing, by the life that you are living. And he says in verse 11 of the same chapter, right? For there is no partiality with God. Okay, there is no partiality with God. But who will be judged first? The Jews and the then the Gentiles or the Greeks. Look at verse um, uh, 9 and 10. Okay, uh, of the Jew first and also of the Greek and also verse 10, the Jew first and also of the Greek. Okay, so 
We're all going to be judged. So we cannot point our finger at others. For if we are pointing our finger at others and we are also doing those same things, we are also going to be judged by the same standards. Okay. So he's saying that, you know, um, uh, in verse 4, okay, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God will lead you to repentance? Okay. So in verse 4, he says, Don't despise the goodness of God. Don't despise his patience. Don't despise the long suffering of God. That means what? What does it mean? Don't despise the goodness. That leads to? Okay, but here it's saying don't despise the goodness, the long suffering. Why does he say that? Verse 4 The riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering. Don't scorn, you know, uh, the goodness of God, okay, or his patience or his long suffering. Don't take that for, you know, lightly or even don't take advantage of that okay but because what does the goodness of god lead to the goodness of god leads to repentance think about that so beautiful right he says the goodness of god leads you to repentance he's saying yes god is a just god, just god his justice demands that he judges sin his justice demands that he judges uh, uh, you know, immorality, okay? But how does God deal with sinful man even if they have gone into deep uh, sinful ways and wicked ways and, you know, um, uh, fallen away from the truth? How does God deal with sinful man? Paul says that God deals with sinful man, you know, by, you know, by through his goodness, his goodness leads people to repentance okay so yes god will judge sin and uh you know but god is really what is he trying to do is he trying to draw people to himself but through his goodness through his mercy through his forbearance and his long suffering that means long suffering means what yes patiently waiting you know patiently waiting month after week after week month after month year after way year patiently waiting sometimes we can give up on people who are sinful we've been praying for some people we give up after some time but god does not give up because god has a very redemptive heart the core of his heart is redemption it's a redemptive god okay he looks to redeeming people from the sinful ways and that is why he him okay so yes he's a just god he's a loving god he's a just god his justice demands that he punishes sin that he judges sin but also he's a merciful god he's a god who's patient forbearing long suffering also who is merciful and he's waiting for the sinners to repent okay so when we how do we deal with people the issue of sin so he's basically talking here to the jews and he knows that the jewish people are not um, patient they are not um, forbearing with people who don't keep the law right and that is what was a big uh, problem in the early church okay if you see most of paul's letters he's talking about you know you don't have to follow jewish customs you don't have to keep the sign of circumcision because all those jews judaizers were coming from uh you know uh, from the jewish faith you know they were becoming christians you know they were uh, telling the gentiles in the church hey if you want to be justified if you want to be made righteous then you have to keep the yeah, the sign of the uh, covenant that is circumcision. You have to follow certain uh, food eating habits. You have to follow certain feasts. And so Paul, you find him writing in most of his books, he's writing about this. He's saying this is not what is important. This is not what is going to make us righteous and going to justify us before God. But what is going to do, it's the grace of God. It is from through faith by faith. 
Okay? It's through faith by faith. You put your faith in Christ Jesus and you live by faith. And it's also, of course, because of the grace of God. Okay? So Paul is saying when you are dealing with people with the issue of sin, or when you're dealing with uh, the sinfulness of people, you know, uh, we know what is right and wrong, but we need to know that the goodness of God leads to repentance. That means he's saying, hey, we must de demonstrate the goodness and mercy of God. Be patient with people who are living in sin, sinners or in, in sinful attitudes. Yes, we. that does not mean that we do not condone sin. That does not mean that we must overlook sin. It also doesn't mean that we encourage sin. But what pa Paul is saying is, hey, we deal with that sin. But how do we deal with that sin? We deal it in a way that demonstrates God's goodness and mercy. Because it's God's goodness and mercy that leads a person to repentance. Okay? So that is very, very important. You know, we are all used to doing wrong things, okay? And uh, it's so easy for us when we are on this side to look at people on the other side and judge them for the wrong that they are doing, you know? And Paul is saying, we all will be judged, the Jews first and then the Gentiles, but yet we cannot point our finger at others because we ourselves are doing that. We can, we'll also, you know, we have no right to judge others because God will judge us, but he's saying, be patient with people. You know, show them the goodness and the mercy of God because the goodness of the mercy and the mercy of God would lead people to repentance. Okay. And then um, verses 5 to verse 11, he basically talks about, you know, again, dealing with um, the talking about the judgment of God, talking about what will happen for those who do not live according to the law or don't live according to the uh, the reason and the conscience, those who go away from the truth, those who, you know, um, do not honor God, those who are living in immorality, uh, self-seeking, who are not obedient, who are unrighteous, you know, he says all of them will be judged. There is judgment, but yet he's saying, you know, uh, the judgment will come Jews first, then the Greeks, because God, but God is not partial. Everyone will experience judgment. But even though God is a God who just who is just and he judges, he's also a God of goodness and mercy, and his goodness will lead people to repentance. Okay. Any questions so far before we move on to verse 12? No? Okay. Can somebody read verses 12 to 16, please? For as many as sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doors of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do not do the things contained in the law, those although not having the law are a law of themselves, who saw the work of the law written in the, their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between the and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. According to the according to my gospel, amen. So Paul goes on to talk how we will be judged. Okay, so he says the Jews have the law and they will be judged according to the law, and he says the Gentiles or the Greeks are without the law, but they too will perish without the law. Okay, and verse 13 he says, You cannot. Uh, he says, you, you just cannot just hear the law, but keep the law in order to be justified. Okay. So, uh, you know, he's saying that, you know, for, the, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So he's telling the Jews, hey, you have the law, you will be judged by the 
law, but you know, you cannot just be hearers of the law. What should you do? You should be doers. In action, you should keep the law. Only when you do it in action, in word and in deed, only then you will be justified. That means only then you will be proven right before God or you have a right standing with God. And then he talks about the Gentiles. What about the Gentiles who do not have the law? Okay, so verse 14, he says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature uh, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Okay. Okay, so what is a judgment uh, referring to works cause our sins have been uh, judged on the cross? Yes, our sins have been judged on the cross, yes. But we continue to live, right? And uh, in our actions, in our words, in our deeds, we can sin against God. Yes, we can receive repentance and sin is forgiven. But even if we have known the truth, we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we continue to live in a perpetual sin or in habitual sin, then there is consequences there is that we face. There is consequences for the sin that we uh, face. There is no um, eternal judgment, so to say, because all those who are born again, you know, we are um, have an eternal place in heaven. We have eternal life. Nothing can rob us of that. But yet we face the consequences of our sin. Uh, is that helpful, Nina? I mean, is it okay now? Can you hear or not yet? No, I can't hear you. Nikhil, okay. can you please put on the your the sun because we can't hear no, Nina. I, John. I just I'll post, no problem. One minute, Nina. We can't hear. We can't hear you. Can you uh, say that again now, please? Uh yeah, we, we now now can you hear? Yes. yes. Yeah, so I've I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> it comes back, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, no I, I think it was about the uh yeah, so what really one is about yes, that while we are on this earth, yes, uh there's always a conflict. Yes, but then uh, for that we have I mean I'm talking about the believers. Okay, so no, I'm, that's why I just wanted to uh, be clear as to this, when we say judgment uh, here, uh, it is talking about what we do, or because I thought there's forgiveness for that too, right? When we repent, so is is this is this that does this come under a different category? Is what I wanted to know. What we are talking uh, about, or what we're learning, yeah. Okay, so here when we are talking about, when he's talking about judging uh, others, you know, um, and it, he's saying, hey, you, you Jews are judging others, you also will be judged by the same standards. God will also is, is judging you. And yes, when we are believers, when we do sin, God is still the same just righteous uh, God and he judges sin, right? But what comes out is uh, grace and forgiveness because of what Jesus has done on the cross, okay? There is forgiveness. The wrath of God does not come out on, the wrath of God the Father who is a just uh, God does not come on us because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But yes, it doesn't mean that because we're living in his grace period and, you know, we don't face the, 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 the judgment of God. It does not mean that we don't face consequences for our sin. We do face the consequences for our um, sin. Okay. So here when he's talking, maybe he's talking about, you know, judging others. And also he's talking about the consequences of the sin that we face. He's not talking about the eternal judgment, so to say. Is that clear now? Okay, so um, he's saying for the Gentiles, we do not have the law, but by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, verse 14. So he's saying the Gentiles by nature, they do things pertaining to the law. And he's saying that the way people are designed, 
they are designed with something inside them they do they have the conscience they have the reason their conscience tells them what is right and wrong and so when they're doing things they do things pertaining to the law even though they don't have the law they do things pertaining to the law why because they have their conscience so what is he referring to themselves uh, to when he's saying here to the law he's saying that they have a inbuilt law okay the the greeks or the gentiles have an inbuilt law what is that inbuilt law <coughs> Their conscience, yes. So he's saying that, you know, the, the, the Jews are given the law by God. And he's saying the Gentiles, hey, you also have an inbuilt law that is working in you. And you know what is right and wrong. And that is your conscience. Okay. So princess, ma'am, when believers take grace for granted and living sinful lives, will the consequences lead to losing of salvation? What do you all think? What do you all think? Will you lose your salvation? Okay, look at what Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and uh, 5 and 6 says. It says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? Jesus, that is salvation, okay, eternal life, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. You've already experienced the indwelling or the, also the infilling uh, power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. To renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Okay, and then it says that um, for such people, there is no more forgiveness of sins, but only a dreadful punishment. Okay, that we read in Hebrews chapter 10. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. Yeah. Verse 26 and 27. For if we will sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins. But look at what it says. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fury indignation which will devour the adversaries. It says if there is no more forgiveness of sins but only a dreadful fearful punishment and judgment okay but in hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 it says for those who have already you know tasted uh, the heavenly gift become partakers you know and they treat the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing then it says there's no more forgiveness of sins but only a dreadful punishment that is left for them okay um I don't know which verse is that. I think this was uh... okay. So we see that we do not know when you know uh, there is no more forgiveness of sins. Which is that sin? Even after we have tasted the salvation, even after we have tasted. Um, Okay, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, 5, and 6. In verse 6 says, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, okay? You know, there is, because they have crucified again themselves, the Son of God, and put him to open shame, okay? So that, we do not know which sin it is when we have already tasted salvation, we have already accepted the Lord Jesus, we have already known the truth, we have already uh, received the Holy Spirit, then we go away, we've fallen away from sin. What is that sin is not mentioned here. So we don't know, we can't judge a person. But God knows, then there is no more 
forgiveness of sins left, but only a dreadful punishment. And this is he Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but certainly a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So yes, can we lose salvation? We can. But which is that sin? Which is that point? The Bible does not tell us. So we don't uh, take, you know, yeah, we don't take advantage of it. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. So, but the sins that we do commit, there is consequences for it. Okay. So coming back to verse 14, he's saying that, hey, you Gentiles, you have an inbuilt law. What is the inbuilt law? Your conscience. Okay. And verse 15 who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So he's saying this inbuilt law that you have, you Gentiles, is written in their heart. The conscience is there in their heart. Their conscience tells them what is right and what is wrong, what is okay and what's not okay, what is fine and what is not fine. So every man is born with a conscience which is a law that is written in their hearts okay so whether you are the jews also you have the laws or you jews you say i didn't know the laws and all that nobody taught me i didn't have parents hey you have an inbuilt law within your heart it's written in your heart and it that conscience that inbuilt law that is written in your heart has the capacity for you to know what is right and wrong okay which is built into every person which is built into every fiber of every person okay now can this conscience be damaged can, can our conscience be dead yes our conscience can be dead our conscience you know our ability uh, can be dead our conscience can uh, be damaged we can come to a place where we can know what is right and wrong and uh, you know that also can be damage that is why we see that you know first time somebody takes a gun a terrorist and tries to you know or shoot somebody they won't be able to sleep for a week they have killed somebody but after some time when they go on this you know they're used to it the shooting spree they won't see whether it's an old woman a pregnant woman an infant or a child they will just shoot and you will just stand there and you when you're looking it on on tv and say how can they do it how can they do it? Because their conscience is dead. Okay, that part of their conscience is dead. I, I used to work with drug addicts and alcoholics. So we used to have these, um, in Kolkata, we used to have um, residential add addicts and we used to have street addicts. So the street addicts will come like, you know, all of us wearing, all of you wearing jeans, will come with their jeans. They look very normal. But when they pull up their jeans, their legs will be like elephant's legs. You know elephant's legs? It will just, just be so bulged up. It will be just so bloated because it's got gangrene. You know, they are taking those, um, not the pure form of drugs. They're, in, they're taking it to the veins in their legs. And they come to the clinic. You get them clean. They'll go through all the therapy sessions. They know that they have to ampute. You have to ampute that leg because it's got gangrene, right? Gangrene can move up and they'll die. They know everything. But they will get it clean and they will just go back after the therapy sessions, everything. They'll go back and they'll inject it in the same place. Why? Because their conscience is so dead. Okay. So Nina and John are saying to fall away would mean going out of the scope of repentance like what uh, Judas did. Uh, yes, to, to fall away, we do not know which sin, but going away to such an extent that there is no more coming back or there is there's no more that point where they want to repent of their sins. There's no more repentance of sins that is left, which means that they go into su such sinful depravity that there is no more forgiveness of sins left. Why? Because for these people, they have known the truth. They have the knowledge of the truth. They have tasted of the salvation. They have tasted of the goodness of God. They have tasted of, you know, they have also experienced the Holy Spirit, but they still have gone away. Then there is no more repentance for sin. 
but we can't say in in uh, yeah judas's case yes you know uh, uh, but he, he knew that jesus was the messiah and all of those things yes but you know he was not born again and you know he didn't experience the holy the presence of the holy spirit this the the gift of salvation it's only in john chapter 20 was 21 and 22 when jesus dies and comes and you know he all the disciples were there he breathes on them and he says you know um, receive the holy spirit that is when is their born again experience but um uh, we do not know when where which sin that is that comes to a place where there is no more repentance there is no more forgiveness because the bible does not tell us that yes so we do not know which sin does that help nina we can't attribute that to Ju judas's uh, sin uh, but you know it is we don't know which sin that is that even after tasting salvation and knowing everything and then you know coming to that real place of uh, you know uh, where we're crucifying the son of god again then there is no more repentance for that kind of sin but only dreadful punishment okay okay so um yeah every man is born with a conscience which is the law written in our hearts okay so a conscience can be damaged and i was giving you examples okay our ability to know right and wrong can be damaged but we need to remember that conscience does not replace the gospel okay i'll repeat that again we need to remember that the conscience does not replace the gospel there's a the conscience is an alternative law but it does not replace the gospel the conscience is just your law written but it does not replace the gospel then verse 16 it says in the day when god will judge the secrets of men by jesus christ according to my gospel so in verse 16 he concludes he's saying god is going to judge the secrets of men according to paul is saying my gospel right he feels ownership for that gospel so much in love for the gospel okay so he says the judgment of god which is a righteous judgment which is an impartial judgment and is a judgment according to the truth will be done according to the gospel of jesus christ so when so paul is telling the jews and the gentiles hey you will not be judged according to the law you will not be judged according to the conscience but you will be judged according to the gospel of jesus christ are you all listening okay it's quite a little uh, confusing okay so you can ask this question now what happens to those who do not hear the gospel how will they be judged okay when you say that the jews are judged by the law we can say okay because they know the law they taught the law when you say the, the the gentiles are judged by the reason and conscience yeah that is okay because the conscience is something that they are designed with they are made with and it's their uh, uh, law that is written in their hearts but how can you say that you will all of them will not be judged either by the law or by their conscience but only by the gospel of jesus christ so what happens if these people don't hear the gospel of jesus christ okay so how do we explain that now paul has explained so far in chapters one and two that there are people who have the law and there are people who don't have the law so that there are two things in every person there is you know that uh, the reason telling them that there is a god and there's a conscience telling them there is what is right and wrong and the reason is telling them hey there is a god and telling them to seek the true and living god right so every person has a reason so through creation every person can look and say hey there is a creator or the invisible attributes of god are seen in creation okay and every person has a conscience whether there's a jew or gentile okay so he's saying that these two things in every person is directing us is convicting us and telling us hey there is a god and because there is a God, you should seek after this true and living God. So every person who seeks after the true and living God, what does the word say? 
they will find God. God will reveal himself. In some way, God will bring the gospel to that person. But what if the person dies without hearing the gospel? What will happen to them? They have reason, they have conscience. There's conscience that says there is a true and living God. You have to seek after him. But they never hear about Jesus and die. What happens to them? Then all that we can state is what the Bible tells us. All that we can say is what Paul says in verse 16. In that day when God will judge them, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So everyone will be judged according to the gospel. No excuse. Say, so we can ask this question, will God have another way to judge people who have not heard the gospel? Scripture does not mention that. Hence, we cannot come up with any other alternative. We can come up with only what we know. All we know is that God is going to judge the secrets of men's heart by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, so we do not know what is how God is going to do it, but this is what the Bible says. Okay, we'll end here, we'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? So yes, we have reason, we have conscience, but everyone will be judged according to Jesus Christ, and there is no other option. Okay, so somehow, somewhere, they will hear the gospel. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Uh, we'll end class. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Um, I'll see you next week.